Once again, our sermon is based on our second lesson that's common on page 5 if you'd like to follow along in the service folder. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Powerful words for us, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Fans, for the past two weeks, you've been reading about the bad break I got. Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. I'm sure that there are some of you in this room that heard the words of that speech, maybe live when he said those. Words spoken by one of the greatest baseball players that has ever graced the diamond. Those words were spoken by Lou Gehrig, the Iron Horse, on June 19th of 1939 on what was called Lou Gehrig Appreciation Day. He said those words in his speech in a crowded and jam-packed Yankee Stadium that had over 62,000 fans in attendance. Every single seat was filled to listen to this player speak. Once again, the, the stats speak for themselves. He's, without a, a shadow of a doubt, one of the greatest players to, to ever hit the ball. He played in consecutively over 2,130 baseball games without missing a single at bat. You heard that correctly. Over 2,130. In one game, he hit four home runs in four consecutive at bats. One year, he won the Grand Slam title. He had the Grand Slam record at the time of, of his retirement. He won seven World Series with the New York Yankees. One of the greatest to ever play the game of baseball. That's why it was so shocking on this day when the 62,000 in attendance in, purpose, in person, when the millions throughout the world heard that he was done. That he wasn't going to play another game of baseball. Yeah, he wasn't having the best season that year. It probably was one of the worst starts to his entire career. In the year 1939, he'd only played eight games that year. And he had a 143 batting average. For those of you that don't know baseball too well, that means he went up to the plate every 10 times and only got one hit. You're not going to stay in the big leagues very long with those stats. And, and he only batted in one run. But I'm sure the fans and, and I'm sure the organization said to themselves, this is one of the greats. He's just in a slump. You know, something's wrong, something's off. He's going to change a couple things, and he's going to be back. We'll be back better than ever. And the next couple months are probably going to be better than any other player in the league. But no, Lou Gehrig was there that day to, to let them know that something was wrong, that everything was about to change, that he was done playing this beautiful game called baseball. Because for a routine checkup, it was made aware to Lou Gehrig and his wife that he had developed ALS, a chronic and, and deadly disease that had no known cure. It was shocking to the world. It was shocking to those around him because it just didn't seem like that could possibly be the case. Because if you saw him with your own two eyes, you yourself would deem that he's anything but unhealthy. He still had that smile. He still had that glow. He still had that build. According to the, the average eye, I'm sure everyone would have said that he was going to have a couple more years to his career, probably live a long life. But under the watchful eye of his doctor, it was revealed to him that he was actually sick and dying. This bombshell was dropped on him and on everyone else around him. Some similarities there between what was revealed to Lou Gehrig, all the Yankees fans in the entire world that day, and the truth bomb that God drops in our second lesson for today. In this letter to the church in Laodicea. I can almost guarantee you that when they received the contents of this letter, they were absolutely shocked. If they knew that Jesus was writing this letter to their congregation, I'm sure I know, and you can, can imagine what they were expecting to hear. 
a thumbs up from Jesus. Everything's good. Everything's cool. Everything's kosher. Keep things going the way that they are. You guys are doing fine. I, I got many problem congregations in my church, but it's not you guys. How, how utterly wrong and, and foolish they were. In these verses, Jesus wasn't there that day to let them know that they had ALS, that they had a chronic and deadly disease. No, he was there to let them know that things were far worse than that. That it, according to their confidences, according to their selfish pride, they were on a path that was far more dangerous than ALS could ever be. Their hearts were corrosive, were eroding, were, were eating away at them at a deadly rate. And if something didn't change, they were going to die, not just here and now, but for eternity. And I know this sounds like a harsh letter, but know that the overwhelming emphasis of it is a message of love. Because that's who our Savior is. We don't have a God who tells us what we want to hear. We do not have a God who tells us what we want to hear. We have a God who tells us the truth. We have a God who tells us what we need to hear. We have a Savior in Jesus that shares the law with us. Because we have a just judge who needs to tell us who we are based on our own individual and independent actions. Enemies of Him. Anything but heirs of eternal life. Wicked wretches on our own. But according to His love and according to His grace, He shares with us the hope that is in Him. Still to this day, there are treatments that you can receive from ALS, but it's inevitable. Once it starts, it doesn't stop. It's ultimately going to take you unless something beats it to the punch. In Jesus' letter for us today, there's a lot of harsh words, but there's so much hope. He has the antidote, he has the cure, and it's him. He shares that not just with the Laodiceans, but he shares that with you and with me who are so similar to them in almost every way. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the hope and the antidote is not in ourselves. The hope and the antidote, the cure, the peace that we have is in our Savior who is never half-hearted towards us, but is whole-hearted in every way. Who, who, who is a Savior that is not somewhat devoted to us, but is fully devoted to us all the time. That is where our hope lies. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus knew who he was writing to that day. He knew his people, right? And no, notice those harsh but true words. I know your deeds. I know what you have done and I know what you're going to do. I know even deeper than that. I know your heart. I know who you are. You are a proud people. But you're proud in and for all of the wrong reasons. Once again, if, if you ask the Laodiceans how things were, how their life was, it was great. It was awesome. Not many complaints from them. There were people starving at that time, but it wasn't them. They didn't need to, to worry about where their next meal was going to come from. They didn't have empty pantries or empty cabinets. They were plumb full. And so were their bellies. Empty bank accounts, yeah right, their warehouses were overflowing. Wearing tattered and, and torn and beaten and worn clothes, not them, but many others. According to them, things were, were going great. Things were awesome. And that's why it can be such a surprise when we hear these verses from our Savior to them. Because Laodicea was well known at that time. Mainly for three things that Jesus talks about in these verses. The first thing that they were well known for is their money. Their wealth. They were a banking center. They were a gold exchange center that was one of the greatest in the entire Mediterranean region. Re remember who John is writing these words to. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, John it is revealed to him through the Holy Spirit this beautiful vision. This vision of Christ victorious for the church and on its behalf. The vision to John is what is to come. Right? What's, what's about to happen, the, the light overcoming the darkness. But in these first couple of chapters, Jesus doesn't want to address through John what is to come, but what is. Not the future, but the present, the current condition of the church. So in these first couple of chapters, he enrolls John to write seven letters to seven churches in what we would consider current modern-day Turkey, but at that time Asia Minor, 
to address his people. And there's some themes that, that come up throughout these letters as John writes them on behalf of Jesus. The first thing tends to be this, some things that they're doing well, some, some things that they can build on, some things that are happening in the church that is God-pleasing. The second one is pretty much every single one of those letters, some things they need to work on, some struggles, some terrible and wretched sins that are alive and well in the hearts of the people that are there. But, but the third thing that is in every single one of those letters, and is definitely in our letter for today, is at the very least one promise from Christ. One promise of hope and peace in response to the things that they've done. And that's where we find the last letter to the seventh church in the book of Revelation. And as you can see, as you can tell, Jesus has saved the harshest for last. There are no proclamations of praise. There are no good jobs or keep it up guys when it comes to the church in Laodicea. Some very harsh words for the things that they are doing. Because the Laodiceans were proud. Proud of their wealth, proud of their gold, proud of the currency exchange. They're also proud of this wool that was there that was, that was sought after so desperately by the Roman world. It was this black wool that only really grew in that area on the, on the animals there. And, and for some reason, they wore it around, they, they taunted it and flaunted it for everyone to see. Some considered it to, to be the modern day silk. And lastly, they took great pride in their health care system, their, their eye care. There was this Phrygian powder that they had, that if they used it, it was apparently to, to bring their sight back, bring their vision. It was in and through these things that they took tremendous pride. That's why Jesus writes to them on this day. Your contentment, your confidence, your fulfillment in all of your successes and all of this stuff is absolutely and utterly worthless, helpless and hopeless. The message of love that Christ is saying to them is stop it. You, you have something so much better in me. That's why he writes these verses. That's why he says to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Harsh words from the Amen, right? That word literally meaning truth. And that's who God is. And the Old Testament addresses himself over and over again. The God of truth, Jesus, that same God in the New Testament, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is writing to this angel of the church in Laodicea, to their pastor, to their under-shepherd, to let them know what is going on. Some harsh words. Many people at that time would, would call the Laodiceans lucky, but Jesus has another word for them. You're lukewarm. You're not blazing hot. You're not set on fire with faith. And you're really not tremendously cold, freezing. You're not avid unbelievers that are attacking the church, but you're really not doing all that much. You're lukewarm. Even nowadays, that is never really used as a, uh, a word of encouragement or endorsement. It's not used in a positive manner. I don't think I've ever heard, and I don't, can't imagine you've ever said that word. Oh man, this coffee is just hitting the spot. It's nice and lukewarm. Right, or I've, I've been just beaten and bruised by this cold that's just been over my shoulders and weighing me down. But thank goodness I got this lukewarm chicken noodle soup to get me going. I would love, I, I'd encourage you to go to a, a nice steakhouse and ask what temperature would you like your steak to say lukewarm. They, they look at you like an absolute psychopath. Not words that are encouraging, right? But that's what they were. The Christians there in Laodicea were lukewarm. And it made me wonder, what would a, a present day lukewarm Christian look like right now? Maybe it'd be a Christian that would go to church on Sunday out of obligation rather than priority. They go to church on Sunday because that's, of course, what Christians do. But if they have to miss a Sunday, they have to miss a Sunday. It's not all that important. We don't see it as the absolute 
and most vital hour of our entire week, over and above everything else, else, something that we cannot miss, something that we should be banging the doors down, to hear what our Savior has to say to us, to shout proclamations of praise to Him, to grow in that relationship with Him. <clears throat> Lukewarm Christian might show up to church and be there physically, but mentally and spiritually they're anything but. There is a warm body in the pew going along with the motions. A, a lukewarm Christian might view their devotions as something that they'll get to when they get to, right? They put spiritual items on their schedule, but they only really happen if pretty much everything else fails, right? If everyone else cancels on me this week, then I guess I got some time for devotion. I only pray when I need to, right? That's what the lukewarm Christian does. When I need something from God, then I'm going to reach out to him. The lukewarm Christian might serve Christ in the church, right? But only when the spotlight is on them. The lukewarm Christian will serve when there is minimal effort demanded of them and maximum praise and proclamation and publicity. The lukewarm Christian doesn't want the behind-the-scenes service. They don't want to get on their hands and knees when no one else is walk watching. That's what the lukewarm Christian does. Those are the, the characteristics and character of a lukewarm Christian. Was that kind of awkward for you? As I was describing a lukewarm Christian? Did, did you think to yourself, man, pastor is kind of attacking me. He's talking about me at so many times in my life. If you felt that way, I want to let you know that pastor was also preaching to pastor there. That I, throughout my life, have felt that way so many times, more often than not. That I have been the lukewarm Christian. I think I've said it over and over again to you. The first person that Christ preaches this sermon to is me, and then I have the privilege of preaching it to you. How often all of us are the lukewarm Christian. Not on fire and not cold. That's what our sinful nature calls us to be. Which we ask ourselves, why? How? What would possibly lead us to ever do that? To become complacent in that kind of a situation? Well, it's complacency, isn't it? Isn't it? It's apathy. It's the temptation that was there for the Laodiceans. It's that belief that if everything is going well... If I'm strong and if I'm healthy, then my relationship with my Savior must be too, right? Strong and healthy and fine and okay. I know who my Savior is. I, I know and believe in Jesus Christ. Those things really aren't all that important. It's the blatant lie of the devil, right? Throughout the scriptures, Jesus makes it very clear. Either our faith is growing or it's dying. There's no plateauing. We don't reach a level and it sits at that pillar. We're either growing closer to our Savior day in or day out, or the devil is pulling us inch by inch away from him. That's why in love our Savior sounds the alarm. Do not be lukewarm. I am not okay with this and neither should you be. That's why Jesus says those harsh words. When you guys are lukewarm, when I am lukewarm, it's like Jesus having to drink a lukewarm, curdled glass of milk. You want to spin it up, it makes you nauseous. You want to get rid of it, you want to cast it out. That's why he has those words, so we stop it. So something in us has changed. Jesus says this, you say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Some harsh words from our Savior. You say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I'm okay, life is good, everything's all right. What does Jesus say you are? You say you're wealthy, healthy, happy, and awesome? When you put your faith when you put your confidence, when you put your contentment in your successes, in this stuff, in this earthly garbage, he says, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You're nothing, and you're even worse than that. If we had the ability to talk to the Laodiceans now, if, if we had that channel, 
And we got to ask him, what does your gold, what does your wool clothing, what does that, that eye care mean to you right now? It means nothing. You can't take that with you in the next life. And even in this life, I know it's not shocking for you to hear that. The things of this world, the earthly items that are here all around us, they can make you happy. But it's only for a set period of time. It's fleeting and, it, and it's failing here today and gone tomorrow. We desperately seek and want something so much more. Something that lasts, something that has substance. And that's where Jesus directs us in these verses. I counsel you, I encourage you to instead buy from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich. Once again, if, if anyone says that Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor or sarcasm, I don't think they've read through the Bible enough. Jesus is bringing up those three things they find pride in and attacking and giving the answer to every one of them. You, you find your confidence in gold? In your gold exchange, in your currency, in your wealth? I want to give you a gold that is so much greater than that in every way. Your greatest bar, your greatest ounce of gold that you have, I want to let you know something about it. It has impurities and imperfection. It's going to decrease in value day after day. But this gold that I want to give you, the good news of the gospel, of Jesus Christ and the things that he has done only increases in value day after day. No impurities, no imperfections, it's the truth. This, this wool, this kind of uh, silk that you guys are in love with, that you want to wear around and show to everyone, or oh, Church of Laodicea, I want to give you garments that are so much better. Because I know those garments that you wear around. With every day you wear them, they're going to get stinky, they're going to get smelly. And it's not going to be long before they're going to be in a thrift store or in a dump. But I want to give you white clothes. Robes of righteousness. That have no stains. That have no sins. That have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. You take confidence in your eye care that can give you the ability, maybe through this frigid powder, to have 20-20 vision. I want to give you faith. That allows you to see me perfectly for who I am your risen Savior and your God, the creator of the world and the creator of you, your source of salvation. Once again, brothers and sisters in Christ, this letter is so harsh, yet it is so loving. Because Jesus says, stop finding joy and contentment and fulfillment in these things, because I have something so much greater and grander in every way. Earthly treasures that cannot be taken away from us. Things that, wrath, that, that rust and moth cannot destroy. He's saying to them, don't, don't take your pride and, and your, your utmost joy and fulfillment in the fact that you're a, a citizen of the city of Laodicea. Find joy that your citizenship is in heaven. That I will open up this everlasting and eternal kingdom and make it your home. Your place of residency both now and forevermore. I hope you noticed in this letter the mercy and the love that is there from our Savior. Even in those harshest words, notice what Jesus says. Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. In your days of rebuking and discipline, you know that's because your Savior loves you. Parents know that better than anyone else. If we didn't rebuke and discipline our kids, we would not be loving. And that's the heart that goes out from your Savior when he rebukes and disciplines you. Jesus doesn't want your life in this world to be super comfortable. It's just a reality. He wants it to be uncomfortable so you don't find comfort in this world and fix and focus your eyes entirely on it. Because when you do, you're taking your eyes off of, you're putting your eyes on what is here and now and taking off of what is to come, which is better by far. So even in those moments of rebuke and discipline, your Savior is loving you. Notice the patience that your Savior has for the church in Laodicea and, and for you this day. Notice what he said there. You're lukewarm. You're something that should disgust me and make me nauseous. I should spit you out, but notice what he says. I am about to spit you out. 
Not I have spit you out. Not it's already done. No, there's still time. Time to be repentant. Time to be brought to our senses, right? Time to be brought back. Because Jesus says to us today, although that's what you've earned, although that's what you've deserved, although you've turned your back on me and run in the opposite direction, I want to remind you where I always am. Listen again to what he says. Here I am. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If you don't want anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The times when our, when our faith in him, when our trust in him, when our devotion to him has been half-hearted and not fully there. Jesus was banging down the door to have us back. Jesus was knocking so that you could be his once more. That's his patience. And that's his love. And did you notice what leads us to open that door? Did you notice that what leads us to open that door when we're brought to faith, when we're strengthened in faith, when, when we're stuck in sin and abandoning our God and we're brought back to him? No. It's not my own logic and reason. It's not my own ideologies and opinion. My thoughts and desires. No. It says when they hear my voice, they'll then open the door. Through the simple yet powerful and profound whisper of the Holy Spirit, through that gracious message of the gospel, your Savior calls you back. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, so often we are the lukewarm Christian, but we never have a lukewarm God. So often we're half-hearted, but he is anything but. So often our devotion is anything but full, but his is overwhelming. Remember what your Savior did so that you could be rich, so that you could be wealthy and healthy and happy, so that your joy could not be fleeting. All of his power, all of his authority, all of his wealth, your Savior set to the side. He put it aside and he took on flesh and came to this world, showing the utmost and absolute nature of a servant by taking on human flesh, being born under the law, because he knew what we were. Poor, wretched, and wicked. He lived in humility and died in shame to make us rich. So that those robes could be ours, so that heaven could be ours, and could be our home, and that we could be his both now and forever. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if in an instant, if at this moment in time, sometime today or later on in your life, Everything you had in this world was taken from you. Gone in a flash. Not yours anymore. You can say in that moment that I am still, at this moment, tremendously rich. Without need, not in want. Because your faith, your, your confidence, your contentment is not in those things. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we don't hold Jesus out at harm, arm's length. We hold him as close as we possibly can. We, we grab him, we squeeze him, we, we pull him close. We, we squeeze tighter than any dad could with the greatest and strongest bear hug this world has ever known. Because that's what we want to do with our leader. That, that's what we want to do with the one that is fully devoted to us. We don't want him anywhere else but right here in our hearts, alive and well and at work. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's alive and well in you right now. That fire that you so desperately desire, that, that fire that, that leads you to want and desire and yearn and thirst to grow in the grace of your Savior, that desire to just serve at all costs, to go out and live as Christ has lived for you, is in your heart right now. Because your Savior lives in you. His love, His grace, His mercy, His patience that He has shown to you, He has given as a gift to you. And He's told you and me, until we take our last breath, go out and share this with everyone you can. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to leave this place and every single one of us is going to demonstrate just how half-hearted we are towards our God, 
how much our devotion is lacking even today. But be reminded that, that everything we are, he is not. Where we fail, he doesn't. Where our love falls short, his never will. That's the kind of God that we have. One that has been, is right now, and will always be fully devoted to you. Amen.